In this video, we're discussing Revelation 6, and I want to remind you that in Revelation 5, we and 4 and 5 actually, there's been a picture that's being illustrated with Christ at the center of the throne, four living creatures that have a, a face like an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a face like a man. And this parallels the cre four living creatures that are in Ezekiel 1. They represent characteristics of the witnesses and the apostles. And they're standing before the 24 elders, which represent the apostles and the witnesses of the end time, the two witnesses of the end time. There's also a sea of glass that represents the multitude in white robes. There's also the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit of God. And Christ is seen with a scroll in his right hand. And this scroll has writing on both sides and it has, it's sealed with seven seals. And an angel comes in a loud voice and proclaims, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? And Jesus is the only one who is found worthy to break the seals of this scroll. And the language of the word is that he's, will, he's able to do that because he has triumphed. So there's something about this scroll that in order to open it, in order to break those seals, he had to have triumphed in some way. And having triumphed over death, he's able to break those seals. So that's what we're looking at in Revelation 6. We're looking at what those seals represent. Now, a seal, we don't usually use this language. So I just want to clarify what this is so that you can get a picture of this in your head. Because there is, throughout Revelation, there's a picture that's being formed. And if you get that picture in your head, then as you're going through the word, you're going to hear certain things and it's going to remind you of that picture that was illustrated for you in Revelation. This is another reason why you need to keep a key in your journal of important terms and concepts that are being used. That way you don't get lost. A scroll is just a scroll with writing on it. The word is referred to as a series of scrolls, each book. And so we're told things like anyone who adds to or takes away from the scroll, let him be accursed. The preservation of this scroll is extremely important. And adding language or taking away language is a way of altering the scroll of God. When people are using rap rapture to replace resurrection, that is a way of adding to and removing from the scroll of God. It is very, very serious. There are 52 references of resurrection. There are two of rapture, and neither of them have to do with the resurrection. Harpazio, that has to do with the resurrection, but it is not a replacement for the resurrection. And so people who promote this rapture doctrine are often using that as some sort of excuse to make their way back and say, no, harpazo means caught up, just like rapture means caught up, caught up. So therefore, it's the same thing. I mean, how is that? That's an interesting way of making it very, very complicated. How about you just use the words that God used and then like all you have to do is go straight to resurrection. You don't even have to like try to figure all that stuff out, which by the way, they made it very complicated and made you take a detour because in the process of that detour, they're rewriting doctrine. Let them be accursed. Truly, because what I have found is that people are very married to that doctrine. They keep perpetuating it. They don't care about truth. I've tried to engage with them. I've tried to have conversations with them. They do not care about truth. It's, it's astounding. They just come and drop off their doctrine. And then when you try to engage them in a dialogue, well, how about this scripture? How about that? They ghost you. They never respond again. Or they respond with only that which they want to take a look at. So they cherry pick scriptures and they won't respond to the, to the position of scripture that you're bringing to them. It's the most bizarre thing. My suggestion to you, by the way, when people are doing that, discern it with God and then dust your feet. I've never had someone actually come to me with that nonsense and come out of it. People who are adamant about it, they're just married to the lie. They've made a lie their refuge. That's their covenant. I don't know what else to say. So... Getting back to the scroll, the scroll is extremely important and it is ex extremely important that we are preserving the accuracy of the scroll and that we are speaking on the language of the scroll because God has established certain language in order to communicate concepts that he also has established. When you start changing the language, 
you also start changing the concepts. So stay true. Stay true to what God has written. He knows what he's doing. He has the ability to maintain his word. But if you start changing things or going after the doctrines of man, you will not understand. You will be led into deception. So the scroll is just the book. The seals are sort of an embossed, like a wax seal that closes up a letter or closes up the scroll. So those seals are an embossment, kind of like a signature. I mean, in, in, you know, the old days, they might have like their initials or something like that. And you hear in the word where, you know, like, for example, in Nehemiah, when they're making a covenant with God and they say, we've put it in writing and we've affixed our seals to it. It's kind of like they're, you know, they're sealing it in their signature. You also hear, and, and this was done with a signet ring yet sounding like signature, right? And you hear that Jesus is the signet ring. He's going to make him his signet ring so that he's been given authority. You also see in Esther, for example, that King Ahasuerus gave Haman his signet ring. And that's how Haman was able to make that decree. Bad idea, obviously, because Haman was a terrible man. But he was able to seal the edict with the signet ring of King Ahasuerus. And even though Haman was a terrible person, that edict could not be revoked. It was that important. Okay, so I just want to kind of give you a sense of what we're dealing with in terms of the importance of a scroll and the importance of a seal. And in this situation, what we're seeing is that Jesus is the only one who has the ability, who has the authority, who is worthy to open these seals. Well, what's happening when he opens these seals? Well, as he's opening these seals, these things are happening. These things are coming into being. You're going to see in a moment that these different seals represent different things. And one of the things that they represent are four horsemen. And those four horsemen are also spoken of in Zechariah. There is a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse in Revelation. In Zechariah, there's a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a dappled horse. Don't get tripped up on that. A dappled horse can also be pale. If you're reading Zechariah and you've read, you know, he's talking about this in in chapter six of Zechariah, but if you're tracking with what's going on in Zechariah, he's talking about the end time. He's talking about the same time that we're talking about in Revelation. So they definitely go together and you can't understand one without the other. So by Zechariah six, In Zechariah 4, they're talking about the witnesses. Zechariah 5, they're talking about the Antichrist who's having a house built for it and is going to be set in the middle of wickedness, of counterfeit Christianity. This is the woman in the basket in the NIV version or the woman who is, you know, in the center of that ephah. Okay, so we know the time we're we're talking about. We're talking about that seven-year period, the first part of that seven-year period where the witnesses are testifying the second part of that seven-year period where the Antichrist is reigning. So at this point, a house is being built for that woman. Now, don't start running away with your own carnality. You have to understand that a house is similar to a kingdom. You are a house as an individual. You're also being built as a house together with the body of believers. You're also being built as a temple with the body of believers. So you are the house of God. What is the house that's being built? Well, the Antichrist is at the center of it. So what do you think? Who else is in that house? Counterfeit Christianity. That is the house of Satan. That is a synagogue of Satan. That is being built, has been being built, but right now it is being built to rise again. And this is counterfeit Christianity. These are People who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, who are going to bow down at your feet. And why are they going to bow down at your feet? Because Christ is going to make them do that and acknowledge that he has loved you. Because they are people who are claiming to be doing a service to God by persecuting and killing God's people. Okay, so that's the context of what's going on right now. So let's read Zechariah. I know that we're, you know, this is a Revelation 6 study, but listen, You have to understand the rest of scripture if you're going to understand Revelation. So we have to cross-reference and we got to see this as a whole picture. I looked up again and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. 
I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel asked, answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven. Okay, there's a footnote here. The four winds of heaven. Okay, so these are the four winds of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horse is going toward the north country. The one with the white horse toward the west and the one with the dappled horse toward the south. All right, this is also going to go along with Daniel 11, when we talk about the North Country and we talk about, or the King of the North and the King of the South. I'm going to show you that in a moment. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. Go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Then he called to me, look, those going toward the North Country have given my spirit rest in the land of the North. All right, right now it's pretty ambiguous, isn't it? <laughs> Don't worry, it's going to come together. Verse nine, the word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josadak. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. Okay, so Joshua, is rec he is representing Christ here. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from, this, from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. The crown will be given to Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away will come and help and build Help to build the temple of the Lord, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. All right, from what you know of Revelation thus far, you should know that this is what is being built. This is what is being done at this time in history. This time in history, this time that you were chosen to live in this very time in history, it's a big deal. You have a lot of, you have a very heavy burden on you. Let me put it that way. You have a role in what's going on at the very end, the culmination of time, uh, the culmination of this age. And I've been talking with you about this. I've been sharing this with you. I've been talking to you about building God's house, and I've been talking to you about cleaning it up and also rededicating it to him. And Zechariah talks about him building this temple, and he says, not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So he is building this. And this temple in chapter four is being seen in the hand of Zerubbabel representing Christ. And here again, you're seeing that Christ is the one building this temple. So I want you to keep this in mind because a lot of people, when they're reading the seals or when they're reading about the Antichrist, they start getting focused on the Antichrist and even doing silly things like thinking that they're somehow going to, you know, hoard themselves into a... I don't know, some sort of like ammunition to fight the Antichrist or, uh, you know, hoard food so that they can bypass the wrath of God. Listen, the way that you bypass the wrath of God, the way that you are passed over is by returning to God. It's not by the work of your own hands. The, the, the one thing that the work of your own hands is going to do is incite the wrath of God and, and truly jealous wrath of God because your hands are an idol. What you're saying is that you don't trust him, that you believe more in what you, your human mind and human hands can do than believe in God, than believe in the word that he's given you and the things that he's already done, the name that he's already made for himself, the reputation that he's already made for himself in giving water from a rock, in giving quail at night, in giving manna from heaven, oil and flour in a jar to last till harvest. Okay, so you're seeing here in Zechariah that these horses who are seen as chariots here and seen as single horses in Revelation. This is correlating, okay? The time is correlating. And you need to understand that as we go about reading right now the seals, that God is the one in control. Because you're going to read about some bad stuff. Right now, you're going to read about some bad stuff. You're going to read about some stuff that the Antichrist is doing. But you need to remember that God is the one in control. And that if you are his, you are loved by him, you will be passed over by him when his wrath comes. But that if he hands you over to certain things, or he determines that it's time for you to die, or he determines that 
this is part of your covenant to not love your life so much as to shrink from death, then that's what it's going to be. Do you really want to stay here longer? You have to understand that in Daniel 12, it says that the power of God's holy people is going to be broken. So in staying here on the earth, the only thing that you're doing is delaying what you need to take up here. By the time this stuff happens, you'll be ready to go home. You need to be built for that courage. You need to be built in order to take that up. So for that reason, I'm always telling you, you need to return to him. He's the only one who can build you for what you're going to suffer. He's the only one who can build you to fulfill this covenant. I know a lot of people who think that God is just going to pick them up any minute now, and they really don't understand that there's actually a covenant that they have to fulfill, certain things that they have to do. If that's you, you need to come out of that thinking. You need to come to the light. You need to come to the realization that you actually have a covenant with God, that you actually have responsibility as an individual. You have a responsibility in the authority in which he has placed you as a parent, as an employer, you know, the house he's placed you over, whatever those things are, whatever he has placed you in, if you're healing as an individual, he's going to begin to move you in that authority that he has given you. And he is going to teach you how to pick up that authority. And then you're going to be given a trust in the body of Christ. You're going to be given a trust in that house, in that kingdom, in that temple, in that body. And let me tell you something. If you're not functioning well in a body, you'll be replaced by someone who will. You have to know that. I know that might not sound nice, but personally, I'd rather hurt your feelings right now than have you forsake your salvation. You got to pick this up. All right, let's go to the seals of Revelation, Revelation chapter six. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. All right, all he's saying is that he's opening the first one that he's opening. He's not saying that he's opening them in any particular order. So you're going to need to understand the order by understanding all of scripture. Because by the time we get to the seventh seal, you're going to see that he's talking about the witnesses. And when did I say the witnesses come? The witnesses come at the beginning of the seven-year period. But the sixth sixth seal talks about the very end, even after the resurrection has taken place. So these seals are not going in order. You need to know that. I'm going to show you as we go through scripture how to pay attention to the language that's being used so that you know what is in order and what is not. So concurrently here, you're going to see that the Antichrist is riding out on a white horse. Concurrently, who's in charge? God is in charge. He's the one who's sovereign. He is fulfilling his words. He is fulfilling his plan. You need to remember that so you don't start getting freaked out. I watched as Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. Pay attention to what his weapon is. He holds a bow and he was given a crown, one crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Okay, so you got, you have the bow is his weapon. He's been given one crown, which is representing authority, and he rides out as a conqueror bent on conquest. That's his agenda. Whose agenda is that? Don't think just because he's riding out on a white horse that he's your knight in shining armor or that he's symbolizing purity. You got to pay attention to what's being said here. Let's contrast him with the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. So we've already got a name. The other one doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a purpose, a reason. He's just evil. That's what he represents. Apollyon, destroyer. Okay, so here his name is Faithful and True. We know who that is. With justice, he judges and wages war. He's been given authority to judge, and that judgment goes along with the way that he's waging war. And that's the weapon he's using. He's not using a bow like the other writer. With justice, he's judging, he's been given that authority, and wages war. He also, by the way, has a sword coming out of his mouth. So imagine what that looks like. With justice, he's waging war. And I've told you that double-edged sword The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. What comes from the mouth of God is the word. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He is the word. With justice, he judges and wages war. Can you imagine what these people are going to go through? I mean, you know, when God is convicting me of the things that I've done in my life, I feel, I mean, I feel like I could just shrink. But if he was doing that all at once or he was like condemning me with it, oof, I can't even imagine. I think death would elude me. I would long for death, but it would elude me. 
His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were, were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of God, of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Very different description. This writer has many crowns, has been given all authority. His weapons are spiritual weapons. You remember what David said to Goliath? You come, here with, you come to me with javelin and sword. I come to you with the power of God. Who's going to win? So keep remembering. I'm going to keep reminding you of who is in control. Who's the one who has power? And if God has determined that this is your time to die, then this is your time to die. If he's determined that you're going to suffer in that, be grateful. Rejoice. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. That's the last of your suffering. You can, you can tolerate anything for that long to be given eternity. Don't start getting freaked out. Don't start running back down Mount Gilead because you are almost there. All right, back to chapter six. Let's read verse two again, because I want you to get a good picture and understanding of how, you know, a sense of who this is, how to understand scripture instead of just reading it and trying to understand it with your brain. Your brain is of no use to God. His spirit is the wisdom in you. Your brain thinks it's wise in its own eyes. I looked and there before me was a white horse. It held, its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Sounds a little small compared to that last rider, doesn't he? I mean, like, what are you going to do with that bow, Satan? Absolutely nothing. Oh, just one crown till you go to perdition and riding out as a conqueror. A conqueror bent on conquest sounds a little pathetic. That's how you need to be thinking about this because you have more power as a child of God than he could have ever. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Now look, the Antichrist spirit has been here. The spirit has been here. The system was at one time in great power, persecuted God's people, burned them at the stake, fed them to wild animals, did all kinds of crazy stuff, tortured them, killed them with the sword, all kinds of really terrible things. That power was, then from the perspective of John, in the vision in, verse, in chapter 17, remember, five had fallen, one is and one was yet to come. And also he was told that the Antichrist who was going to rise again was, now is not, from the perspective of John, five had fallen. He's in the sixth kingdom at that time, which was atheistic communism. So at that time, it was not, but would rise again and go to, its, and go to perdition. It has not risen yet again, but it still is here and has power. It was, now is not, will rise again. That power is rising right now. It is being built right now, and it will be here in less than three years. You have some preparing to do, because unless you're one of the two witnesses, the best that could happen is that you're one of the multitude in white robes. You better pray that you are, and if so, you are going to be here, and you are going to be fulfilling your covenant, so you need to be preparing yourself for that time, and the only way you can prepare yourself is to submit to him, and he will prepare you. So this rider on the red horse is given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. And it was given a large sword. This has already been happening. This is the work of that antichrist spirit, okay? This has been happening. When I was a child, you could ride your bike all over town and be okay. But then there started to be weird things that would happen, like you'd start hearing about kids getting kidnapped and weird people following them while they were riding their bike or walking home from school. You'd start hearing about things that, really were not worries that people used to have. And now I hear stories nearby where I live, not, not too far from where I live, of women saying that they're just walking on the street and a van door swings open and they're being held at gunpoint and told to get in that van. I hear women talking about going grocery shopping and someone's following them home. And then suddenly there's another car following them and then another car. There's some weird stuff happening right now, you guys. You never heard about this. You never heard about 
trafficking and kidnapping and all of the crazy things that are happening right now. And it's continuing to get worse. Peace comes when you are choosing the spirit of God. God is a spirit of peace. That's the only way that you can have peace. And I tell you in so many of these videos that you have to choose his spirit, that we as a people have to choose his spirit or there's, there's going to be another spirit that's going to reign over us. When God says, when I send these things, when I send famine, famine, plague, pestilence, when you see these things, here's the agreement I'm making with you. When you see these things, you have to know that I sent it and then you have to return to me. And in order to return to me, you have to know how to return to me in fasting, weeping, wailing, mourning, sackcloth and ashes, humility, repentance, turn from your wicked ways. If you return to me, I will return to you. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. Wait, restore me for what? So that I can go live my own life? No, I will restore you that you will serve me. There's a purpose in restoring you. If you utter worthy words, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. God's got a purpose in what he's doing. And when his people turn from him, he starts sending these things. And when they still won't return to him, it goes into motion that destruction is coming. And he sends his prophets to warn. As it's written in Amos 3, 7, he does nothing without warning through his prophets first. So don't let anyone tell you that the witnesses are coming at the very end. What would be the point of that? He does nothing without warning through his prophets first. And those witnesses are sealed before harming the fir before the first four angels are harming the earth because they're not here after the first four trumpets. They're not going to continue to be here. They're going to die at a certain point. The people are going to kill them yet again. Jesus said that. I'm going to send you more sages and prophets and you're going to kill them too. Okay, so you have to understand why peace has been removed from the earth. Because remember what Paul said, that God will continue to hold back the Antichrist, until he's taken out of the way. How is God taken out of the way? When you stop choosing him, when you spurn him, when you reject him. That is how this writer is given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. This has been happening. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come, I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in its hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice coming among the four living creatures saying two pounds of wheat for a day's wages or a denarius that's a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and wine okay so this sounds like a tax being sent out doesn't it and in daniel eleven twenty, when talking about the antichrist it says that he will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor well what does that mean the reason we started with Revelation 17 is it because it makes it a whole lot easier to understand scripture when you know who the Antichrist is. When you know that the Antichrist is papal Rome, then this makes perfect sense, doesn't it? The tax to maintain the royal splendor. Tithing is no longer required. When, when Jesus sacrificed once and for all, the sacrifice of tithing was fulfilled. It makes no sense that the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her would continue having, making you pay tithing when you're not doing animal sacrifice. That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, this is the tax that maintains the royal splendor. Let me tell you about indulgences. The Catholic Church claims that if you pay a certain price, your sins will be forgiven. They give you a little certificate. This is a tax on your sins. They tax your sins. Have you ever heard of such a thing? They'll not only tax your sins, but they'll tax the sins of your ancestors who are deceased. So they claim that you pay a little bit of money and your ancestors can be absolved in purgatory. Is that a tax to maintain the royal splendor? And its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. Scales are usually used to measure things. You know, you're measuring things out, but you're also measuring justice. You remember that that other rider that represents Jesus is judging with justice and he's waging war with justice. So there seems to be something going on here with regard to justice. We're also seeing that they're using those scales to measure out the wheat and the barley. Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages for a denarius and six pounds of barley for a day's wages for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and wine. They seem to be selling this at a price. And remember that Jesus uses the bread of life, bread in order to help you to understand what sustains your soul, what sustains your body so you understand feasting on every word that comes from the mouth of God 
which sustains your soul. He uses oil to represent the Holy Spirit and he uses wine to represent doctrine. And all of this seems to be coming at a price here. Christ says that you can drink of that water for free from the well of life. But here, this Antichrist is charging you for it. You cannot serve both God and money. So why is it that the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her are getting so rich off of claiming to be feeding you? These worthless shepherds, they claim that they're feeding you, but they feed you at a price using scales that are unjust. Okay, so how do you reconcile that? What, what do you mean? What do you mean scales that aren't just? God said, don't cheat each other in business. And these, are, these people are doing business. They have made a business of God's church and they are not even giving you what you're paying for. They are concerned about maintaining their own royal splendor. They don't even care to give you the truth. These are scales that are unjust. And it's the reason why in Revelation 18, 6, he says, give her back as she has given, pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. And what is the cup? The cup filled with the abominations of the earth? That golden cup that they hold up in Catholicism of wine representing defiled, satanic, pagan doctrine? Pay her back double for what she has done. Unjust scales. Cheating you of life. Cheating you of truth. Verse 7, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so we've already talked about what's happened to God's people. I mean, they've been fed to wild beasts, literally. They've died by sword. They've died by fire. What about this famine and plague? You know, if you watch a documentary or read up on the Black Plague, for example, that first like terrible, terrible plague, I mean, that was awful. You know what religious people were doing? They were blaming the people for their sins as though it wasn't coming from the harlot, not leading them into understanding. Because if there was any understanding, then what would have been taught to people is return to God and he will restore you. Return to God and he will pass over you. Instead of doing that, flagellates were walking through the streets, flogging themselves, dripping in blood, spreading disease. Like there's nothing like that to spread disease, right? And claiming, because this, this is a claim of Catholicism, right? Their, their pedophile priests use this. What can we do that's just so disgusting that we could just humiliate ourselves like Christ? Yeah, they use that in order to cause their victims to think that the disgusting things that those priests are acting out on them are somehow holy, that somehow they're doing what they're supposed to do by humiliating themselves like Christ. Same thing with the flagellates. Is that what Christ calls us to do? Because last I checked in the Bible, he wants our hearts. He drove demons out of people who were doing stuff like that. And that is exactly the spirit behind that disgusting message. They were not leading people according to God's word but claiming that they are his word somehow, that the Pope is the vicar of God. What are they doing right now? It's, it, listen, this is a repeat of history. I've been saying this all year now. A paradigm is repeating itself. I've been saying it for almost a year now. Once again, this counterfeit church, the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her, their solution for everything is politics. The politics God, the science God. Dao to si climate legislation, anything but return to God. And when they're doing that, they are leading people to die by plague and famine because God's not going to heal us if we don't return to him. If we keep trying to do this by the work of our hands, he will not heal and he will not restore and he will not heal our land. So are these things that are being sent by the Antichrist? Well, some of it is being acted out by the Antichrist, but all of it is being sent by God. You saw that in Zechariah 6. All of it is being sent by God. Those are the four winds or four spirits of heaven. Satan doesn't have any of this. this. None of this belongs to him. He is permitted to act out certain things when we are handed over to him for choosing him. But it's only at the permission of God. And it's only within the bounds of what God says he can do. Remember what Paul said. He will continue to hold him back until he's taken out of the way. That breaks my heart to think that we could take God out of the way. That we could turn from him and spurn him to such a point that he's taken out of the way. And that is why this is happening. Verse 9, when he opened this, 
fifth seal, I saw under the altar, by the way, Christ is the altar. So you might want to write that into your key, that Christ is the altar. Remember that he tells the, he's telling the Pharisees, uh, you fools, you swear by the gift on the altar, but what's, what, what's more sacred? What makes the gift sacred is the actual altar. Well, you're the gift on the altar, by the way. You are the sacrifice. Who are you being sacrificed to or on? Christ is the altar. If there was no Christ, your gift wouldn't mean anything. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Okay, so you have to understand that the full number of their brothers and sisters, that when the word says that the power of God's people, that this is going to continue until the power of God's people has been broken, what is being said in Daniel 12 is that all of us are going to die. We're all going to die. And you need to prepare yourself for that. All of us are going to die. Yes, the two witnesses are going to be martyred. So will you. If you are in him, so will you. How's this going to fare with the pre-trib rapture people? Hmm? How do you think they're going to feel about this? It's going to be kind of weird, right? So all this weird revival talk right now, this counterfeit Christianity that's rising over at places like, like Asbury University, all those people are going to think, oh my goodness, we're, you know, we're experiencing that revival that we've been you know, lied to about, basically. Where's revival in the word? There's no revival. There's no movement that's supposed to happen like this. Even 2,000 years ago during, you know, in Acts, when the Spirit came on the apostles at Pentecost, they were saying that people were drunk, like they were making fun of them. It wasn't like, oh, we're, they were televising it at some university. That's so dumb. Nothing about that speaks Holy Spirit to me. Where are the gifts? Where's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Because, you know, at Pentecost, the people who saw it and knew that that was the Holy Spirit, like they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. How did they know? Because people were speaking languages that were not their native language that they didn't know. And others were able to interpret in their own language. They understood in their own language. So I just like to know how the Holy Spirit is moving through something like that. If indeed the Holy Spirit is bringing that together, I'd, I'd like to know how that fits with the word and the pattern that God has established and the signs that God has established. Cause I didn't see it in the, you know, the videos that I saw of it. All right. So you need to know that you will die. That's going to happen. And I'm not talking about a natural death. I'm talking about this is going to be a terrible death and you need to be prepared. And the only way to be prepared is to prepare yourself in him. And remember that it's not the dying of the witnesses that fulfilled their role. It was them continuing to testify for 1260 days. So don't think you're just going to fly by the radar and just wait until you die. You need to be doing something right now. And the only way you're going to know that's something that you're supposed to be doing is by returning to him and being built by him. You need to get your house in order. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is describing what's happening at the, at the, the uh, seventh trumpet. Okay, so there's 45 days. Uh, in which God's people are going to remain on the earth during God's great wrath. Somewhere in those days, the trumpet is going to be blown and the mystery of God will be accomplished. We don't know the day or hour, but we could know the year. Potentially, we could know the year because he gives us some very specific numbers of days. And he also tells us that when the twigs of the fig tree start to get tender, then you know that spring is here. So it's not as though you're going to be left in the dark. It's not as though you're not going to know that it's going to happen any day. We're waiting right now for my daughter to have this baby. We're waiting for that delivery. And I got to tell you, it's like torture. <laughs> it is like torture. I'm so excited for this little baby. Every day, every minute. I mean, I'm doing the work that God has me doing, but I am thinking about that baby. And I am thinking, praying for my daughter that she's going to have a good delivery and a beautiful birth. But I'm waiting for it every day. I don't know the day or hour he's going to come. But I do know that delivery will come. I do know that deliverance will come. And I know that it's near. You're going to know that it's near. You won't know the day or hour, but you will know that it's near. All right. So we know that this description here is describing when the trumpet blows. We know that from Revelation 11. We know because Jesus told us in Matthew. We know when this is happening. 
Now pay attention to the language right here. Thus far, you have seen in verse 3, in verse 5, in verse 7, verse 9, when the lamb opened the second seal, when the lamb opened the third seal, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, now you're seeing different language and you're going to need to pay attention to this in Revelation. You're going to need to pay attention to whether he is just seeing the vision in this order or whether these are actu- these events are actually happening consecutively. You understand what I mean? So you can see a vision where God, where God is showing you this and then he's like, well, let me show you this too. Well, let me show you that. And you can also see a vision where God's saying, and then this is going to happen. And then that will happen. Okay. So you got to pay attention to the language. You're going to see in scripture where John is being shown something and then scripture is going to say, and then I was told that I must prophesy about many, you know, like more things. And so you know that there's some sort of a break in the sequence of what's being described. Here you're seeing, I watched as he opened the second, the, uh, excuse me, the sixth seal There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth. And then you're seeing in verse 15, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else. Okay, so you're seeing, he's using language to tell you that this is happening sequentially. That the earthquake happened, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? In chapter seven, that's the end of chapter six. In chapter seven, you're going to see that the seventh seal represents the witnesses. That is not happening sequentially because you know that the witnesses come before all of this is happening, right? They come at the beginning of the seven years. So you, it, it wouldn't make sense to say that all of these seals are happening sequentially. You know, if you're looking at a scroll and there's a bunch of seals on there, it may not be in any particular order. Someone might have just said, okay, affix your seal to this. Might not be in any order of authority or anything like that. So pay attention to the language that's being used in, well, all of the Bible, but particularly as we're studying the book of Revelation. You know, I think I said earlier on in this video that um, that the color of the horses representing the king of the north and the king of the south, uh, that that had some re- relevance. After looking at it, I, I'm not so convinced of that. I'm going to have to sit on that one for a little bit longer, but I'm actually not convinced of it. So I'm going to leave that part out, and I hope that you've enjoyed this study. I look forward to um, studying with you on Tuesday, unless my daughter has gone into labor then someone else will um, will be running the, the Bible study, but show will still go on. So please still show up. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.